In a book, there are chapters that together create not just a story, but an entire world or reality that you can transport yourself into. Each of our own lives is made up of similar chapters that form the story of who you are and what you have become. Entrepreneurs often take elements of their own story and inject them into the businesses they start and the work they do. Few have done that as well as Michael Chernow, the founder of multiple businesses, including The Meatball Shop, Seymour's, and now Creatures of Habit. Authenticity is not duplicable. No one can take your authenticity away from you. You can't just fabricate it. It's either is or it's not. Business of business is storytelling and also the business of business is relationships. Two things that I believe wholeheartedly in. If you're not able to tell a story with your business, it's not good. Human beings for hundreds of thousands of years have always sat around a fireplace and told stories and listened to stories and some of the best times in my life. Those moments where you're engaged and someone's telling a great story and people are laughing and crying. Those are the moments in life that really make memories. And so how do you do that with a business? To understand who Michael is, you have to peel back his layers. And with each layer you uncover, you realize that Michael's unique life experience, his likes, interests, hobbies, and routines, they not only make up who he is, they reveal the through line that runs across all of Michael's business ventures. He has woven together not just one story, but many in a way that is authentically Michael. And we're getting into all the layers right here on The Journey. There are always exciting things happening in the world of small business. The news that grabs the headlines, though, are always the highlights. The overnight successes, the billion-dollar IPOs, the massive exits. But just like your Instagram feed, that's never the whole story. Let's look deeper than the headlines and press photos. Underneath all of that is the real work of building something valuable and lasting. Don't get me wrong, I love crazy success stories and can be drawn in by those big flashy tales just as much as the next person. But we all know that what's more important than the destination is how you get there. It's the struggles you have to overcome and the insights you learn along the way that make you who you are. So those are the stories we're telling. It's raw, it's honest, and maybe it's exactly what you need to hear. I'm Hillary Georgie, and this is The Journey. So, anyone who owns a small business knows what the difference between surviving and thriving feels like. And obviously, we all aim to thrive. That's why we're excited about our latest partnership with UPS. Our listeners know that whether you're moving your business online or getting into new markets or just trying to make things run faster and more efficiently, small businesses are up against a unique set of challenges. That's why UPS designed innovative tools just for small businesses that are made to help take you to the next level. Learn more about how UPS can get your small business moving forward at ups.com slash pivot. Any good tale needs a beginning. And Michael's journey started in New York City, where even as a kid, he was hustling. Young Michael was putting cash in his pockets by selling toys and baseball cards, then graduating to dog walking and rollerblade delivery of videos and vegan food. As early as I can remember, I had a drive to make, do, and create. I just always had this ambition to do. I can remember in that age bracket, five, six, seven, eight, I would ask my older sister to come downstairs with me in front of our apartment building so I can lay down a sheet and put all of my toys that I didn't want on the sheet and sell them for a buck to people in the neighborhood. I was a big baseball card collector as a kid, and I used to go to the baseball card comic shop and I would buy the $5 grab bags If I didn't get anything I wanted in the grab bag, I would stand outside the shop and try to sell the comics. By the time I was 10, 11 years old, I had a a real dog walking business. I was walking like 30 dogs. Then I was able to get a real job 
which was delivering videos for couch potato video on my rollerblades. And while I was delivering videos, a friend of mine was working at a restaurant, a vegan restaurant, ironically. And he said, hey, the video store is a couple blocks away. Why don't you also do deliveries for the restaurant? And I said, great. I was just taking on whatever I could and I was excited to work and I wanted to make. And my life has sort of been that way. Michael didn't grow up with much and he saw that through hard work, he could get the things he wanted. As a kid, those things were cool sneakers and a Jansport backpack. But as he grew older, he was driven by a deeper desire. Michael was pushed by his why, which was to connect with people as much as he could. And that why, combined with his business acumen, is a blend that is critical to entrepreneurial success. But life doesn't go in a straight line. And even folks who are smart and driven and capable can stumble and fall and fail. I know because I've been there. So has Michael. Before he started his first real business, The Meatball Shop, there were a few battles he had to fight and some demons he had to overcome. I can't tell you what pushed me over the edge. I just know that I got it in my mind. I fixated on it. I did everything in my power to pull it off. And I did. So what did that look like? What was it that you were doing to pull it off, especially when people weren't so sure about what you were doing or saying like, Are you, maybe this isn't a good idea? Big moment in my life. I got sober when I was 23. So that was like a big pivotal moment for me. That was an opportunity for me to say, okay, what you've been doing is not working. Now you have an opportunity to sort of start again and you should take full advantage of that because you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's exactly what I did. I got sober 23. I made a plan to go to culinary school, saved up some money. While I was there taking my chef's culinary course, they were offering a restaurant management program taught by Cornell Hotel School and Union Square Hospitality. So I enrolled in that. I got a full scholarship. And then I graduated about two, two and a half years after I started and I made a plan and I said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And I don't know how that all sort of came to fruition, but I said, I'm going to go to culinary school. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to write a business plan. I'm going to raise money from regulars at the restaurant that I worked at. And again, ask everybody else I know. I'm going to get my best friend from childhood, Daniel Holzman, to come back to New York from the West Coast. He's going to be the chef of the restaurant. I'm going to run the front of the house and we're going to open up a restaurant together. And verbatim, that's exactly what happened. It's true. That is what happened. The meatball shop opened and was an almost immediate success. But the story isn't as black and white as Michael paints it. There's more layers to the tale and parts of Michael's lived experience that impacted how and why the meatball shop came to life. And so far, maybe it seems like we've breezed through Michael's story. But that's because it takes a while to peel back the layers of a person or to read the full book. Sometimes the people around Michael didn't put in that time. They didn't make the effort to see the whole person in front of them or what he was capable of. There was one person in particular that made this mistake. And it was his doubt that put a fire under Michael that pushed him forward. And I remember clearly when I was 24, Going on 25, I took my boss at the restaurant that I was at and I said, I, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And he looked at me and said, Mike, you know, I love you. You're good, but I don't know if you have what it takes. And that put some fire under my ass. He said, you need to go to culinary school. I took some advice from him and I just went off on my journey and I put my head down and I said, I'm not going to stop until I at least fail. Michael was inspired, he was motivated, and more than anything, he was confident. He had battled through some hard things before and had made it through to the other side. And so he knew in his heart that there was nothing that could stop him now. I believe that entrepreneurs have a superpower that is kind of hard to describe. There's a threshold that most entrepreneurs that I know have their threshold for pain is very, very high. Their lack of, not lack of fear, but abundance of courage is abnormal in comparison to the rest of people. When I was thinking about doing my own business, the meatball shop was my first real business. 
people were asking me if I was nervous or scared. And I couldn't relate to that. I was like, no, I'm not. Not that I don't think there's an opportunity for failure potentially, but that thought of this might not work did not impede on my absolute optimism and positivity for success. It's a good thing that Michael had that superpower and that positive outlook, because in the early days of getting the meatball shop off the ground, there wasn't all that much to be positive about. You know, we didn't raise a ton of money. We raised literally the bare minimum of what we needed to raise. Daniel and I did not hire any people to help us build out the restaurant. So we did it ourselves. I was very new to construction at that point in my life. I wasn't like a a New York City kid. We call the the super. Daniel, he's also a New York City kid, but he comes from a family of construction workers. So he grew up around construction. He really understood it. So from the day we started, it was pretty much Daniel was just telling me what to do. And we didn't have enough money to turn on the heat in the restaurant that we were building. We were building this restaurant all December, all January. It was freezing cold in 2009 in New York. It was a cold winter. We would just work 18, 20 hours a day in the bitter, bitter cold. And I got pissed off at him for telling me what to do all the time. That was tough. It was really hard. But it was worth every penny and every minute because we put every single nail into every piece of wood in that restaurant. We laid every piece of tile. We really did that restaurant from soup to nuts by ourselves. Even though it was painful when we were battling with each other in there because of how stressful it was, it brought us closer. The blood, sweat, and tears didn't just serve to bond the friends and co-founders closer. It also became one of the hallmarks of the meatball shop story. And when people heard and saw what Michael and Daniel were building, they couldn't help but feel connected to the founders and their business. Early on in the journey for Daniel and I, we were told to get a publicist and neither one of us have ever worked with a publicist before, but we said, okay, you know, who do we call? (laughs) So we invited a few of these publicists over to the restaurant and this one guy, his name is Phil Baltz. He owns a very reputable restaurant focused PR agency called Balls and Company. He came in and I was on my knees sanding down the bar. Daniel was installing the wainscoting and he saw two guys that were working their asses off covered in sawdust and asked us our story and we told it to him. And he said, I don't care what you guys pay me. Like you guys have got something special here and I want to help you. The meatball shop crew adjusted fast and the company only kept growing, eventually opening multiple locations and shipping nationwide. But scaling the business was hard and it took Michael away from doing the things he loved most. We were scaling the restaurants and my job had a lot more to do at this point with doing real estate deals, managing construction crews, picking out light fixtures, which I kind of enjoy, but it just took me away from the people. And so when you're starting out a business, you start with all the people on the team, right? And then you get money to scale and then you kind of get taken away from them. Michael felt like he was losing the plot. He was still doing something that was authentically him, but there was more inside of him that needed to get out. He needed a new blank page to tell the next part of his story. Stay with us. Today's podcast is sponsored by UPS. If you're like a lot of our listeners, you've either taken your business online or you want to make that shift fast. Well, UPS makes it easy to ship and save wherever your e-commerce takes you so you can launch your business into a whole new orbit. Whatever platform you're using to host your online store or track and manage your shipping, UPS is already there. You'll get big savings and reliable shipping that give you a competitive edge and keep your customers happy. You can ship from your online store to your customer's front door faster than ever when you choose UPS. So get started today at ups.com slash pivot. Michael believed he had done all he could for the meatball shop. He had turned his past experience as a server at a restaurant eating meatballs in the back into a highly successful business. And now... 
he was itching to bring to life something else from his past. I grew up in New York City as a kid, and on Sundays, my sports team would always go out to Freeport or Capshi, Long Island to go fishing. I became hooked on fishing. I was so passionate about fishing. My whole life, I'm a fisherman. I love fishing. And when I was thinking about the next project, I said, man, you know, it's so weird. I grew up fishing in New York, and I never ever see the fish that I grew up catching on menus. Bluefish, blackfish, porgy, monkfish, none of them. Like I, you see every once in a while, you see monkfish is like a special on a menu. Flounder, you see fluke. You're not like tuna, salmon, halibut, cod, lobster. And so I said, there's gotta be something going on here. And I started doing a bunch of digging and I found out the ocean's in big trouble. I've got to use the fish that nobody wants to try to introduce them back to the New York market. It's crazy. I grew up eating this stuff. It's delicious. So I linked up with all these fishermen from Montauk to the Carolinas. I just linked up with all these Northern East Coast fishermen and said, I'm going to sell more blue fish to New York City than it's ever happened before. <laughs> and I did. I want to bring underutilized species of fish to New York. It's crazy. We can catch them 100 miles away and we're flying fish in from 5,000 miles away. Let's figure out a better plan. And so it worked, knock on wood, you know, but that's the story of Seymour's. Michael's story as a restaurant worker and as a fisherman were told through his first two businesses, the meatball shop and Seymour's. But the thing that makes Michael truly who he is was still hiding below the surface. His deepest layer had yet to be uncovered. His past businesses were authentically him, but they were just the chapters leading to the climax. Which brings us to Michael's newest venture, Creatures of Habit, a wellness brand that is built on the foundations that helped Michael rise from the ashes of his own struggles. I knew that after opening up 12 restaurants that I really wanted to do something absolutely for sure in wellness because it was the most authentic to me. I wanted to be able to tell my story through business. And Meatball Shop and Seymour's both have very authentic, real stories. This creatures of habit thing is my story. It was the blueprint to my happiness in life. I need to be able to tell this story and help as many people as I can that are maybe not even struggling, just looking for something new. To understand what Michael is doing with creatures is to understand Michael himself at his most raw and most vulnerable. Wellness is the cornerstone of my happiness in life. And success is a byproduct of my happiness. I've been really, really lucky to have some successes throughout my career. I owe it all to self-care. I owe it all to me making a commitment on a daily basis to put myself and my family, but really myself first. And I don't say that in a selfish way. I say that in a way where I know that if I feel well inside, I am the best version of myself. I know that I'm a better husband, a better father, a better employer, a better brother, better son, better coworker. I am just better. And I learned that pretty soon after I got sober. I really learned that. 17 years ago when I got sober, these two guys dragged me out of the street and threw me into a Muay Thai kickboxing gym. And they said, you are going to change your life. We are going to help you. We're going to help you develop a structure and a foundation and a daily plan stacked with positive wins that you might not think are positive wins right now because you're dying, but they are, we promise. And this is what it's going to look like. You're going to wake up early in the morning. You're going to have a big bowl of oatmeal. You are going to go to a support group. You are then going to go to the gym. And then you're going to have grilled chicken and broccoli. And then you're going to go home and take a nap. And then you're going to go to work and you're going to have grilled chicken and broccoli. These two guys I really looked up to, they were sober guys. They were covered in tattoos and they were badass. And I said, you know what? It looks pretty good on those guys. I feel like I could get behind this. I have no idea what they're telling me. I didn't know what to eat. I didn't know what healthy was or not. You know, I was just a maniac. I just listened to what they had to say. And I made a decision every single morning to do what they told me to do. I started with the oatmeal. I went to this meeting. I went to the gym. I had chicken and broccoli. Within a short period of time, 
I went from a kid who was overdosing on drugs to someone who began to have some self-respect. And that self-respect turned into love. And then that love turned into confidence. And then that confidence turned into ability and strength. Within a year, I was in the best shape of my life, healthy, with a woman who's now my wife. Actually, we met that long ago. I felt like I had been given a second chance. And it really all started with those small little things like oatmeal and chicken and broccoli and fitness. That's what really gave me this foundation to create from. I've stuck with it for a long time. Michael took the structure and components of the routine that saved his life and put them into a business plan that was a little different than what he had done in the past, especially when the prospect of opening a restaurant was put on hold during the pandemic. So I'm going to make these breads that are grain-free and gluten-free. I'm going to make a bunch of sauces. I'm going to make these granolas. And I'm going to make the best oatmeal on the planet. Because oatmeal saved my life. And I was going to use those products as the trajectory to scale that business as opposed to stamping out restaurants, which I knew I didn't want to do anymore. I was going to incubate in the restaurant, create awesome products for CPG retail, and then boom, go to market. When the restaurant wasn't going to happen, I said, you know what? I'm going straight to CPG. I'm going to do direct to consumer and I am going to start with oatmeal because oatmeal is what kickstarted my whole entire plan. And it's the one thing out of all those things that I was told to do in the early days that I still do every single day. Creatures of Habit launched with Michael's protagonist oatmeal, which is a microcosm of Michael himself. It is packed with protein. It is crafted to help you start your day off right. And it is one thing that you can lean on every single day to ground you. It's a way for Michael to connect with people and help them in the same way that others once helped him. It is authentic and real and represents the entire journey that Michael has been on. Every business Michael has started represents a chapter in his life. And together, they tell the story of Michael as an entrepreneur. The chapters are cohesive and they are connected because they are true to who Michael has been and who he has become. Creatures of Habit brings his story to a new level. But the story isn't finished. The final chapter is still being written, and Michael is letting us in, page by page, layer by layer, with each company and endeavor he gets into. And at the heart of all of it is authenticity. As Michael told us at the top of this episode, authenticity is the key to great storytelling, and great storytelling is the key to creating a business that resonates. That honesty and rawness can't be taken away from you, and it can't be copied. It builds trust and loyalty from day one. Your story is uniquely you, and is what makes your business uniquely yours. Or, as visionary Hildegard von Bingen beautifully put it, quote, Dare to declare who you are. It is not far from the shores of silence to the boundaries of speech. The path is not long, but the way is deep. You must not only walk there, you must be prepared to leap. The Journey is created by Mission.org and sponsored by UPS. To learn more about the show or mission, visit Mission.org. And to learn more about how UPS can help your business, visit ups.com slash pivot.